Now we're going to handle some questions from the audience. If you have a question on a card, you know, uh, pass it to one of the people walking uh, up the aisle. And also in the interim, if you have uh, some time to fill out the survey that's on your chair, uh, we'd appreciate if you do that so that you can deposit that on the way out. Um, I've never found a tick bite or rash, but have symptoms. Test, I've tested negative for Lyme. Is it still likely to be Lyme? Um, I think there's so much that goes into the history. So you need a really careful, methodical uh, story of how long they've been sick, what are the other symptoms. I find if you don't have a positive test, you know, which I do order, is that then I still have to look and make sure there's no other illness. So that if they are still sick, I often use a rheumatologist, neurologist, just to get their perspective. If all I get is a fibromyalgic thought, and Lyme seems like a reasonable answer, I'm gonna treat. And very careful, uh, carefully follow them and base it so much on the symptoms. And, and much of it has to do with how sick they are. You know, one mild headache, one slight fatigue, you know, they're probably not going to be in my office, but uh, so it's very much uh, positive, uh, if, you know, and rewarding to um, make those judgments. And I think that uh, Dr. Phillips had described how many uh, research cases never make that, uh, that tick and rash uh, in their, uh, and when they make that diagnosis. Um, I've had three bullseye all in the same spot, blood work all negative. Do I keep pursuing a Lyme diagnosis? And this is asking it again, is it, does it make sense to treat based on symptoms? Um, one, one thing about Lyme is that sometimes that rash is the inf actual infection, you can culture it. Sometimes it's an immune response to Lyme, so you might not actually ever find in that spot and it comes back and comes back. So I always treat that rash anyway and treat a second time, but if that's all you get, you just have the same rash, same rash, and persistent rash, I send them to a dermatologist. If there's nothing else going on, it hasn't been for some time, it's just that, I'm probably not gonna keep treating just for the, the, the coloration. Sometimes it'll stay brown for a while. Um, the, the other half of it is um, just treating uh, the treating symptoms. symptoms. You know, that's what doctors do all the time, like a headache. It's, nobody's ever seen a headache, done an MRI of a headache, and, ever, and those kind of things. And so it's something that we, um, we never have the luxury of a blood test, never have an organism. Lyme has a luxury of actually having some rashes and having an actual a bacteria that you can see under the microscope and do something with. It's just that not everybody fits that specific, clear, objective test. It's just that, so as doctors, you still got to look at the patient, follow them carefully, include specialists as you go along. But in the end, just like fibromyalgia is mostly symptoms, Lyme in the end, the most important thing to a patient is not that original blood test. It's how sick you feel and you're always making some judgment as a doctor as to, as to how long to treat, maybe change an antibiotic, maybe if they're, uh, if they're having um, lots of emotional issues, treat the emotional side. If they're pain, do pain management at the same time, try to exercise, try to eat right. All those things might. What are the differences between a normal blood test from a lab compared to a blood test performed by a specialty lab such as Hygienix? The, the, all there is at the local lab is a standard ELISA, and usually it's from a Mardex kit. And I find it's not very sensitive. So if you actually get a positive on that, it's, um, you know, every doctor agrees that that's a positive. The reason I like something like an, an Igenix or MDL lab is that they look at more bands, they get more information about the bands, the tests tend to be a little more sensitive, and so um, I find that that helps me get more information than I, it gives me some bands that the, uh, the local labs don't have to offer, so. Um, from time to time, I use Igenix or MDL Lab, uh, but you know I prefer to use my own judgment as a doctor, uh, whether I have a test that shows it or not. The other thing about things like Igenix Lab, it it's keep introducing new tests, and new techniques. So as a research department, they they're trying to come up with a much better test, 
than the standard ELISA and Western blot. So I think as long as they keep working at it, working at it, working with pro professionals, they're going to um, kind of move the field along. Can hygienic tests give false positive tests because they're so sensitive? Um, I think that uh, hygienic has, uh, you know, pioneered that instead of five bands for everybody, in a, in a Western blot IgG that often two bands give you almost the same amount of information. So why make the bar so high? Now, they didn't feel, and I think their studies show it, that they didn't, they didn't lose much information by going to two bands. But still, no matter what you do, is you get two bands, you still have to combine what you see from a blood test, get them into the office, use your clinical judgment anyway. So even if whether it's five bands or two, or a 41 band, all of that still is, is just information that you use, throw in the tick, throw in the rash, um, and put, it put the whole story together. Um, I, just, I just feel that we have to have much, much more sensitive tests than what we get from the local lab. And Igenix and MBL lab at least are saying, listen, let's get a better test, let's move on with it, this is what we got now. Let's keep moving the field along, and uh, we have to have advocates like that and try to improve the test. So I think the quick, quick answer is yes, that any lab can have a false positive test. However, I also want to just briefly touch on a positive Lyme test doesn't mean Lyme disease. I mean, what people need to also be aware of that there are hundreds of strains of the organism that causes Lyme, and they're finding something like 95% of Lyme cases are caused by 30% of strains. So most of the strains are kind of wimpy. And when they do Lyme antibody tests just of healthy people in Lyme endemic areas, you routinely find that 10% test positive. And it's tempting to think of these as false positive tests. But if you compare that to areas where they're not Lyme endemic, you'll find that they're not testing positive for Lyme in any reasonable you know, concentration. So it's not just a lab test diagnosis. So what do you call the people that are asymptomatically infected with Lyme? You know, if it's not Lyme disease, do they have Lyme health? I mean, so it's not so uh, simple. And uh, we don't know if those people will get sick five, 10 years, 15 years down the road. They very well may get sick and they very well may stay healthy. So I'm just saying, you know, we shouldn't uh, cookbook uh, Lyme disease. It really takes a little bit of uh, looking into and, you know, and uh, a little common sense when we approach it. How about this one? Uh, why do spinal taps? Is it why just do? to, why do spinal taps? Is um, it I'm, I used to do spinal taps every Wednesday. It was like spaghetti day. Um, <laughs> I don't do spinal taps anymore. I think that it's a fairly invasive test for the amount of data that you get from them. And if we really are very much concerned with something else, let's say someone, you know, if, you know I had a patient a long time ago, they thought she may have um, uh, Kreutzfeldt Jacob, you know, that's like a mad cow and a human version. Obviously, you know, those types of things are necessary. But when you're dealing with more run of the mill stuff that, you know, it's either Lyme or it's not, that's not really uh, um, something that I think is uh, a good, you know, uh, risk-benefit ratio for me, so I don't really, uh, uh, I don't say not to do the spinal taps. If someone's going to do a spinal tap, I'll expand the uh, spinal fluid testing to make it more comprehensive. I'll advise them to freeze some fluid, because who wants to go through it twice? Having had a spinal tap when I was 10 years old, maybe that um, peppers my decisions a little bit, but I'm not a big fan of spinal taps. Uh, 